and Joe. Well, hello, hello. Welcome back to Evidence-Based Families. Thank you very much for joining us once again uh, in this, our fifth episode. Yep. Um, Today, uh, in the, well, last month, well, May, still this month, um, is Mental Health Awareness Month. And in that, uh, to go a little bit with that, we are going to be talking about a very um, a, a special subject, uh, topic that hits But before to we hit subjects, we're going to thank you for your support for last week's video. So we're planning to keep on making those short capsules so that you don't have to spend your time watching a video that is 35 minutes long. So for those people who like to use YouTube to watch short videos, we're sticking to that. We're going to record our regular podcast, the whole length of the podcast, and we're going to still publish it to Podbean, Apple Podcast. So be sure to keep following those. Um, and on regards to, the, to our YouTube channel, we're going to make um, short videos in which we will present strategies, very short uh, tips to handle the topics we tackle on every week. Yes. So... Can we go into the topic? Sure, definitely. All right. So our topic this week is postpartum depression. Postpartum depression. Yes. Something very few people know about. Well, and as a my lot wife of people said, know about, but very few people are entirely aware of it. Yeah, but as as you said, we're doing this especially for um the month the month of May, which is mental health mental mental health, health awareness, awareness month. month. Yes. And I want to begin this podcast with um, quoting the article that we have chosen for this week. And it says the following. We're going to place the article in the description box so you can read the article um, along with other little investigation that we have done. Okay, so in 2016, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force issued a recommendation that all pregnant and postpartum women be screened for depression, highlighting the need for medical providers to be alert to the potentially serious consequences of unrecognized and untreated maternal psychiatric illness. I want to say that it is funny, curious, I don't know, something like that. Funny. That also in 2016 was the year that I gave birth to our second child, Avril, and was also the year that I developed and suffered postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. It was also the year that your doctor husband didn't even think that his beautiful wife could be suffering from a postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety yes <laughs> yeah so um, as I was saying earlier it's amazing how little people know about this condition itself um, I think in retrospect and I am like telling myself why didn't they teach us more about this in medical school or as once you become a doctor as a primary care physician why don't they tell you about it and it's unbelievable the amount of patients that suffer from peripartum or postpartum depression literally 20 percent of all the complications you're going to have is of postpartum depression it's the most prevalent complication after you give birth 20 percent of women with women after three months after delivery will develop postpartum depression and of all the maternal deaths, 20% are attributed to postpartum depression. So it's huge. And it's a shame that we're not taught to identify this disease or pathology on time. Um, in that also uh, scope uh, that you're talking about, um, the families and the, the patient itself is made it's, it's not made aware of, of how common this disease, these diseases are. Um, and therefore, if you don't know how common they are, you don't know that you are actually exposed 
in, in, in like a yeah, very high percentage of actually suffering from them. You know, you are entirely aware that you can, um, that your C-section scar or that your um, wound will get infected or can get infected. Can, uh, can get inf infected. Um, you know what to look for, you know what to expect. And you are not, but you're not told about uh, postpartum depression and how it can affect families. And the family doesn't know. A, a husband doesn't know. Uh, the, the if you have a doula, the doula doesn't know. Parents. Your friends don't know. The kids don't know. Nobody knows. Not even the doctor knows. Not even your primary care physician, your gyne gynecologist knows. And if the person knows, well, they're not doing their job properly. Indeed. Especially because it is known that this disease has a lot of risk factors that can actually be prevented. So knowing that this disease has that amount of or that many risk factors, it is that's why to me it is son so unbelievable. Undetected, unprevented, and untreated. Which makes it pretty dangerous. Of course, because depression is not something to joke with. Absolutely not. So we're going to get into risk factors now, yeah. right? Um, right. So before we begin with the risk factors, I just want to remember, I forgot to say this before, but we're doing this article. It's called Peripartum Depression, Early Recognition Improves Outcomes. It's a review article written by Margaret Howard, Nick Nikita Meta, and Raymond Powery. And it was published in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine in 2017. So it's a pretty fresh article. And the title says it all. But just let's just keep going with the risk factors. So, what do we have here? Okay, um, some of the risk factors are uh, depression during pregnancy or before pregnancy. Uh, just a history of uh, suffering from depression or any other mental illness is uh, categorized as a risk factor for postpartum depression. Um, if you have a mother that's had more than one kid and that mother has a history of a depressive episode in the postpartum period of that first pregnancy, then you have another, another increased risk of developing a postpartum depression afterwards then. That's also in, one. Indeed. Poverty is Well, we also don't have to know. We don't have to explain why, do we? <laughs> <laughs> Conflict with primary partner. Yep, definitely. Poor social support. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Well, my conception on that is different from yours, but sure. Um, poor social That's support. That's why it's so interesting. Yes. I think social support is um, uh, how much help does a mother get from her social... Circle? Circle in, in the postpartum uh, few, few weeks, months, maybe. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly medical attention or... Uh, mental health uh, physician counseling. or counseling, just support in general. Uh, do you have people that are going to be there for you when you need to take a nap and the baby is awake and somebody needs to burp the baby or whatever? Um, this is what I understand of poor social support. I also understand the same thing. I also like to broaden the concept. So yeah, definitely social support, that's what it means. You're going to have your mother-in-law, your own mother, your grandmother who are going to come and help your own husband. But at the same time, I like to broaden the concept because society, it's social. So um, you should have a health system that is able to detect and act on those kind of things. So you should have a social worker or you should have a psychology, a psychologist that's assigned by the hospital that can um, give you a follow-up in the couple of days that you are admitted at the hospital. Um, and I would like you to talk about the example with your um, sister-in-law in North Carolina. But I, I don't limit the social support to the family. I like to broaden the concept and also include the people that are supposed to help because of the health system. So you want to talk a little about your, about your sister-in-law? Yeah. Um, it, it was uh, surprising for me to see. At the moment, I thought it was, oh, my God, they're, gonna, they're burdening her with all, these, uh, with all these things to be filled out. My sister-in-law gave birth to my first nephew in North Carolina, and I was there for the birth of uh, Alejandro. And when she gave birth, she was admitted in the hospital for five days. 
And during these five days, she got every day uh, different questions, questionnaires to be filled out about how she was feeling emotionally, how would she um, place herself uh, aside from the basics of how many times the child is pooping, how many times is he being fed, um, those kind of uh, things of the baby and uh, breastfeeding and everything. But also there were there was a special attention to how are you feeling, how how do you how are you managing it, are you resting enough, how many hours are you sleeping, do you feel that you need to sleep more. Um, they would you know they even asked her, do you want to stay in the hospital one more day. Uh, do you feel that you need us to take the baby to the nursery so that you can have uh, uh, some rest or whatever? Um, so it was very, uh, it, this was North Carolina I'm speaking about. Uh, here, in, I gave of birth course. of both my you're gonna, kids. You're going to find that here. I don't think you're going to find I it here. I gave birth to both of my kids in the DR. Dominican and it's Republic. it's sad how th this did not happen. I was not asked about, um, yes, how I was asked. Yeah, but you were asked because they had to ask, how are you feeling? Because you just had a C-section. Your body was just open with a scalpel. Yeah, but, but it's not... just a very basic question of how do you feel? How are you feeling today? Uh, are you good? I'm tired. I'm yeah. hungry. I want a hamburger. Oh, but that's normal because you just gave birth. Exactly. Okay. It's not, listen, I have this standardized so questionnaire, not, yeah. which is going to help me identify risk factors that you can have to develop a peripartum depression or postpartum blues or a postpartum anxiety and that is that is something that um, when you told me that I'm like wow where are we why are we so behind something so simple you just have to educate the health providers you just have to educate um, the nurses in the hospital to do that kind of thing that kind of screening. Or have the personnel in the maternity wing to be able to do this, to of go course. around the uh, uh, the rooms to new moms and ask these questions, have a doula go around and provide these questions, have a psychiatrist or a psychologist go around evaluating and screening uh, these mothers, um, have have uh, breastfeeding experts to go around and help mothers who are interested in breastfeeding be able to be successful in it. We don't have this here. Yeah, and I want to put again the example of my cousin. Like she gave birth uh, like five years ago to her first baby. Um, the baby did not want to want to engage on uh, her breastfeeding, and she was desperate. She was about to feed her formula. So you and I went to her house. We told her, "Listen, this is not gonna be this way. The baby is not is not breastfeeding not because she doesn't like to grab on your breasts, but because." Um, you, maybe you're not hydrated enough. So we started her on a lot of fluids. Um, we gave her a couple of tips on how to do the proper engagement of the mouth and the nipple. And we asked my aunt, who was a, a counselor for La Liga de la Leche, the League of Milk. I don't know how you call it in English. But she went over there and she gave her tips. And It's actually La Leche League. La Leche League. Yes, I <laughs> forgot about it. I have a diploma from them and I forgot about it. So she went there and she helped her out. And her kid breastfed like for a long time. And then she had another one. And that one also breastfed. So we, that's why I say we do not have social support here or I think anywhere. Now, another risk factor for de developing uh, postpartum depression is having multiple kids, but it is not associated necessarily to the number of kids you have, but more to the psychosocial factors that surround those multiple kids. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, um, the social support, but if you have, again, low self-esteem, or if you're single as a mother, a single mom, then you're gonna have an increased risk of developing a postpartum depression or any of the other symptoms or syndromes we talked about earlier on. Absolutely. Which we are about to talk about right now then. Yes. Um, we have, we want to make very, uh, we want to help make clear the difference between these syndromes. And they are, once again, postpartum depression, PPD, baby blues, and postpartum anxiety. Uh, so, please bear in mind, baby blues is not a kind of music. Okay? It's not a kind of music. We are going to... Uh, help you understand what's the difference first with uh, uh, from postpartum depression and baby blues what's the major uh, the key factor here time 
um, if you're feeling down, you're feeling uh, very sleepy, or you're having, you're lacking sleep because you can't go to sleep. Because the kid is always crying. Not just because of that, but you're, you're having a hard time falling asleep. Um, you're, <laughs> you don't want to eat. You feel that you, you're just feeling off. You, you feel emotionally a disaster. You're crying a lot, maybe, or you're not crying at all. Um, but you're feeling emotionally a turmoil. Uh, and this goes on for about two weeks, um, 10 days to two weeks. It's normal. This is baby blues. But 75% if it's, of women actually go through baby blues. Yes, yeah, 75% of women who give birth. I mean, that's of course, yeah, most definitely. of women who give birth. Of every 10, 7.5 women, which you say 8, <laughs> go through yeah. postpartum blues. That is a lot. And most don't even notice yeah. that they but went through. The good thing is years. that it is so limited that it resolves with support. Within 10 to 15 days. Reassurance and adequate sleep. Like postpartum blues will Absolutely. be self-limited. But then you have uh, these symptoms exceed the 10 to 15 days. And then it is one of the other. Either postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. How can we differ? differ Defer from one or the other. Differentiate. From Differentiate one, or the other. one yeah. from the other. Postpartum depression is uh, just this feeling of uh, you, you don't want to do anything. You don't want to get out of bed. Uh, you have sleep disturbances. You lack energy. You feel worthlessness or, or low self-esteem. Um, you feel guilt, uh, difficulty concentrating, keeping focus on things, indecisiveness. Uh, psychomotor retardation or agitation. When we say retardation, we mean like um, everything you do, you do it very slowly. You're physically slow, like a sloth, literally. Or the total opposite. You're hyperactive, you're moving, you're agitated. And in the most extreme cases, uh, thoughts of death or suicide. So important to say, the postpartum depression will be just like a major depressive disorder, just like it. You're going to have your exactly low mood, like your, low, it, only your loss that it of is, interest, yes. and at least five of those things Alicia mentioned. But the difference, it'll only happen to 20% of women. Like I said earlier, this will go beyond the two, the weeks. two weeks. It'll peak at three months, and this has to be treated by a professional. Can you enlighten? Once you are able to identify that you have some, you have a condition that needs to be uh, treated or taken care of, you need to go to a physician. You need to go to a psychologist or psychiatric, a mental health specialist in general. Um, and then we have postpartum anxiety. How can we differentiate postpartum depression from postpartum anxiety? Well, postpartum anxiety involves physical symptoms as well as postpartum depression. There's changing in eating and sleeping in sleeping. There's dizziness, hot flashes, rapid heartbeat, and nausea, uh, which are all associated to postpartum anxiety, as well as the inability to sit still or focus on a particular task at hand. For the majority of women, these feelings kick in sometime between the birth and the baby's first birthday, but in some cases, they begin much earlier, meaning prior to the birth. But also, I want to uh, add that in recent studies, according to my uh, psychologist and doctor who... Because you went to treatment for a postpartum depression and for, anxiety. For postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, according to my doctor, uh, postpartum depression and anxiety can show up at, in the second year Up to of the second year of birth, yeah. Of the child. After birth. Yes. So in my case, it was uh, diagnosed about... 15 months after birth 16 yeah yeah 15 to a year and a half months. yeah a year and a half um and i was in, i was in full panic attack mode uh and when i was uh needed to be intervened and medicated so yeah i found a, a very interesting quote in one of our articles also which i want to read to explain a little bit of my uh, particular case and uh the quote says, if you're anxious and it's getting in the way of your life, you may begin to feel depressed about that and vice versa. Which so if you are depressed, you may start to feel anxious. 
Yes, huh. about being depressed. Hand in hand. Hand in hand, indeed. So, uh, this is the importance about uh, being uh, able to identify uh, whatever uh, is going on, how you're feeling, whatever emotional changes you're having, and if uh, to be able to catch this on time. Because if not, you can just go on a, and create a snowball yeah, and adding then, things then to Then you that. start saying to yourself, damn, I'm depressed. I have the symptoms. I, am I anxious? What's wrong with me? Uh, I, I'm not going to be able to bond with my kid. But then the kid senses this thing and the kid I'm gonna starts... Tell you my, I'm going to tell you what my, my specific thoughts were. I thought, well... In the first couple of weeks, I had my, well, my wound got infected. Yeah. Um, I was dizzy to the level that to be able to get out of bed, I had to grab myself from the walls to get the baby from the crib. Um, I had to, well, it was just, it was disturbing. And I thought, oh my God, something has got to be wrong with me. Um, either I have some kind of surgical instrument left inside of me from That's the surgery. That's your thought. Like you thought, thought you had a gauze inside of you. Or scissors or clamps or something was in there and this was all happening to me. And, uh, or I don't know, or something is just really wrong. I'm developing something. My, the least of my thoughts was postpartum depression or anxiety. As I said earlier, you do not know what you find if you do not know what you're looking for. None of us was thinking about a postpartum depression, right? Indeed. And then I went to my doctor. Um, your because primary I was care like, physician, your gynecologist. Yes. I went to her and I was like, okay, you know what? Something is wrong because I, this is not normal. I did not feel like this when I had the first baby. I was perfectly fine. This hurts. Like my everything in my body hurts. I, can't, I can barely stand up. I can barely be and exist. I can't get up. I can't do anything or anything. And um, it was just really frustrating. And that frustration uh, led me to anxiety. I believe that's what it is. Because I, at some point I said, oh, my God, I have to have a tumor, tumor or something. I, I have to have something. Something has to be wrong. Because so because it's not, you were depressed, you got anxious. I got extremely anxious. And you yes. worsened your condition. So that's why and it's at some so point, important. Yes. And at some point... Dizziness began, and I could, it, it was the, the most interesting thing of this all is how you mentioned earlier in the Spanish version of how you have these, this um, normal worries that you have when you have a kid. Well, this is how you differentiate from uh, postpartum depression and anxiety. What, if you, it's normal to have some level of uh, worrisome for, with the baby. Um, you worry that the baby is, uh, I don't know, that the baby may have vomited. You're worried that the baby is, is going to wake up and you're not going to hear it. And every time you subconsciously just like, you know, okay, I'm aware. You get up and you check the baby. Um, it's, it's normal for a mother. But then it comes a point in which it, it prevents you from leading a normal life. Yeah. And that's when it becomes anxiety. That's when that, that's when when you have those normal worries. Once they become obsessions, there you have to tell yourself if you are aware that that can happen. Okay, there's something wrong here, because as you said, it is normal for a mother to wake up and just go to the door and see. Oh my God, she's breathing. She's not dead. She's still rolling around. But when it becomes an obsession to the point that you can't lead a normal life, and that is the definition of all psychiatric disorders. Yes. It has to be a condition that has to interfere with leading a normal life. So it is interesting that you mentioned that. So as we said, um, we have postpartum depression, which is what we're talking about today. But you cannot leave it alone. You cannot forget about postpartum blues. It's not just going to go away. Yeah. It's not just going to go away. Like postpartum blues, that would good sleep, good reassurance. You're going to be fine. Postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, you have to get help and that's why being able to identify it it's so important we're going to leave in the description along with the articles we're going to leave the links to the edinburgh postnatal depression scale so that you can fill it out if you have had kids um just fill it out yourself go back to that try day. to remember how you felt in those uh, first couple months or how you're feeling now if you're if your child is uh, under Less three than, or, yeah, or under two. Under two, yeah. Uh, just fill it out. Tell yourself, okay, do I think, could I have been depressed? Um, could I have just had a baby blues? Um, am I depressed right now? Like, maybe that is the answer. 
to your current predicament or was the answer to your previous predicament. So just go fill that out because we have understood after studying this topic for a long time, and we're not professionals at this, but we've lived through it, that being able to identify um, the problem is going to be a, is going the thing that's going to make you have a solution to it. So as we said before, um, postpartum depression is not going to just go away. You need to get help, of course. You're going to have people who are just saying, medicate me for this, give me some pills, give me something I can take. But um, even though most women prefer pharmacological therapy, it has, there is evidence that the non-pharmacological therapy works and it works fine. But the point is, you need to get a professional. This is not you something your mom is going to help with, no. you, with this. Mm -hmm. Your spouse is going to help. Of course, they will serve as support, but you need a professional. And I want to say something also. Um, it's one thing is uh, the normal tiredness of a uh, recently uh, of a new mom or of, of, of an operated patient or of an operated patient. And something else is a mental disorder. Uh, when your mental health is compromised, um, it the level of tiredness or physical uh, conditions or whatever, it's just different. It changes. It's not just your your body trying to heal or you trying to gain this connection with your baby or whatever. It's something that it's actually, it hinders you from leading a normal life. Yeah. So remember this, um, be always aware. Um, I love how this article finishes with its last point. It, um, well, it's um, one, the last one, the last before last point is increased awareness is the key. So we have to educate I, as a doctor, have to be able to teach this to the people around me. Peripartum depression is something that's real. It's not going to go away. Um, two of every ten women go through this thing, and if we don't do something about it, it's going to keep being underdiagnosed. So if you are pregnant, go to your PCP, your primary care physician, ask him or her about it. What are your risks of developing this thing? If you already have your baby and you feel, or even if you don't, ask, ask questions. What's your possibility of developing this thing and if you already feel or you have this if you this, have friends who are pregnant yes if you have uh, a sister that is pregnant a cousin a sister-in-law uh, a close friend um, whoever you know around you that is either pregnant or uh, just gave birth to their baby or is about to give birth just be aware of how this person is and how is he or she he, she feeling actually um, and try to lend a hand or, you know, yeah. try to help her be aware of, of how she's feeling or how she should be feeling or what, what should be happening, what should she be alert and aware of. Yeah, and this is very simple. It's because not treating depression is hazardous. So it is a danger because, remember, depression is not something that's, like, in the air floating around. It is an imbalance. It is a biochemical imbalance, and it can bring problems. So if you identify someone, know someone who's at risk, please help them out, throw them a hand, ask them to fill out those questionnaires, ask them to, to see people who know about these topics, to go to psychologists, psychiatrists, even their PCPs or their gynecologists, and they have to understand something, and it's that once you have this thing, you have to deal with it. It's not just going to go away. All so. right. We would love to hear your experiences. I have shared quite a bit here <laughs> of my experience. Um, so I would feel at ease if you also shared some of your experiences. Remember, you can share with us through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, our YouTube channel. We're going to be uploading later on the week, perhaps this weekend, a short video with... Um, the predominant risk factors on how to know which people or which women are at risk of developing a postpartum depression and um, the main differences between postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression, and the postpartum blues or the pregnancy blues. So share, comment, remember to find this thing on Podbean, um, also an Apple podcast, and do not miss out on our video at the end of the week, all right? Thank you so much for joining us uh, this week, and we look forward to having you next time. Well, have a great one, and ciao.